shaken to the core. The queen has had to make that choice between the crown or a family member. And it's something that, if you are not strong enough, it will tear you apart. Told by America's number one royal source. We have incredible relationships, incredible access. We often know something is going to happen before the rest of the media does. You're going to hear revelations that you've never heard before. Harry and Meghan wanted to turn their public life into a private life. As a couple, they were under an incredible amount of pressure and scrutiny. They made it known how horrible this was, that their privacy was invaded in this way. But what would happen next was shocking. They dropped a bombshell that rocked the monarchy. This wasn't just headlines in England. This is headlines in every single country. This was panic stations for the royal family. And the world is waiting to find out what will happen next. What did it mean for their titles? What did it mean for how they could earn money? Not everybody is on the same page. That much we know. They are totally royal rebels. It's changing everything for the future of the monarchy. What happens now? How does a girl born and raised in California end up meeting and marrying a royal prince? It sounds like something out of a straight-to-DVD movie, and at first glance, Meghan and Harry seem like an unlikely match, but they have more in common than you might suppose. We all think we know the Meghan Markle story, but this is who she really is. Meghan Rachel Markle was born 5,000 miles away from Prince Harry in California. People readers are obsessed with Meghan Markle because she was just an ordinary American girl. She grew up in Los Angeles in quite a regular family. She lived an ordinary life in many aspects. She was born to Thomas Markle and Doria Ragland. Meghan's dad actually worked in the entertainment industry. He was the lighting director on shows like Married with Children. And her mom had a bunch of different jobs. She was a yoga instructor and she was a social worker. I think her parents each brought uh, different life experiences to her childhood and to raising her. And Megan was really adored. When Megan was born, she stepped into a pre-made family. She had an older stepsister, Samantha, and brother, Thomas Markle Jr., from her father's previous relationship. It was a blended family. And one of the sweet stories from her childhood that she shared is that she had coveted um, a Barbie doll set that was called a heart family. And it came in a white version and a black version. Her dad actually went unbeknownst to her, bought both sets and then mixed them so that it looked more like her family. It just goes to show how cherished Megan was by her parents and how much they wanted her to feel proud of her biracial heritage. However, a happy life for this blended family was short-lived. By the time Megan was six years old, Thomas and Dora's relationship had come to an end and divorce followed. Although it wasn't as acrimonious as some of the stories you may have heard. When Meghan first came on the scene, the royal scene, there was some really nasty speculation and headlines about Meghan's rough childhood, where she'd grown up, and really, frankly, racist um, approach to that. And it couldn't be further from the truth. They did everything they could to ensure that her childhood remained as loving and stable as possible, encouraging her creativity, making sure she was getting the very best education she could. In LA, Megan attended the Little Red Schoolhouse and was soon writing to the very big White House. Yes, at the tender age of 11, she had already started campaigning for women's rights. When she was just 11 years old, she saw a dishwashing detergent commercial on television. It was by Procter & Gamble, and she felt it was very sexist. The gloves are coming off. Women are fighting greasy pots and pans with ivory clear. And Megan said to her parents, why, why does it say women? Um, you know, don't, don't men also wash dishes? 
So her dad actually encouraged her to write a letter to Procter & Gamble, which she did. And the result was incredible. They actually changed the commercial to people across America. That got Megan her first kind of national attention. And she saw that her voice mattered. Write letters and send them to the right people, and you can really make a difference for not just yourself, but lots of other people. As a teenager, Megan attended the Immaculate Heart High School, an institution known for its liberal arts and drama courses. You know, Megan always really wanted to be an actress. Even when she was in school, she was in her school plays and musicals. She was very popular, and she just kind of lit up the stage. After she graduated college, she was determined to make it as an actor. She had to start somewhere, and in 2006, she took a job as briefcase girl on the game show Deal or No Deal. Her role on Deal or No Deal, while it definitely wasn't showing off her acting skills, it was a great opportunity for her to get in front of the camera, to make some connections, and for people to see her on screen. After being a working actress for a while, her big break came in 2011 on the legal drama Suits, where she played paralegal Rachel Zane. Mike Ross? Hi. I'm Rachel Zane. I'll be giving you your orientation. Wow, you're pretty. Good. You've hit on me. We can get it out of the way that I am not interested. No, I'm sorry. I, I would... Take notes. I'm not going to repeat myself. I love you. Rachel Zane actually was kind of a lot like Meghan Markle in my mind. She was very smart, very well put together. She did not suffer fools at all on that show. And she had a big heart. She just wanted to help. Once Megan hit the big time, she had a platform and could use it to further her passion for activism. Megan also promoted herself on social media with her own lifestyle blog called The Tig. You'd think that with everything going on, she wouldn't have time for romance, but she did. Megan met Hollywood producer Treble Engelson in 2004, and they had a long relationship and wed in 2011, and they seemed like a great fit at first, both pursuing these careers in Hollywood, him behind the scenes and her in front of the scenes with suits. But the marriage was not to be. They were under a lot of pressure, trying to sustain a long-distance relationship, and it proved to be too much for Megan and Trevor. Their marriage lasted less than two years, and Meghan mailed back her wedding ring to Trevor, the divorce papers citing irreconcilable differences. Meghan was back on the market and ready to find her Prince Charming, unaware that he was living in London and was an actual prince. Across the Atlantic, Harry had a very different upbringing and a life that would turn him into the man we know today. Harry was born into a family that can trace their ancestry back over a thousand years. Let's take a quick look at his family tree. Harry's grandmother is the queen, but she's also the Duke of Lancaster, and she's married to a duke, the Duke of Edinburgh. Beyond that, we've got their children, the Prince of Wales, Prince Charles, that's Harry's dad, his brother, Andrew, the Duke of York, Edward, the Earl of Wessex, and Charles' sister is Princess Anne, but she's also called the Princess Royal. Prince Charles married Diana, the Princess of Wales, and they have two sons, William, the Duke of Cambridge, and Harry, the Duke of Sussex. Thanks to his brother's kids, Prince Harry is knocked back to sixth in line to the throne, and all being well, he's now never gonna get his hands on the crown jewels. Although Harry was born into a world of breathtaking privilege, he suffered a tragic childhood. Harry's childhood is really rooted in tragedy. His mother was killed when he was just 12 years old, when she was chased by paparazzi in Paris. And so he had to deal with that tragedy at such a young age, which definitely affected him for life. For anyone who remembers the death of Princess Diana, one of the most heartbreaking elements was seeing her young sons, William, Harry, who was just 12 years old, having to maintain that famous stiff upper lip. Everyone had to be stoic and be this brave face for the nation when Harry, a, a young boy, would have just been absolutely, you know, crushed inside. We all remember the envelope with the word mummy on Diana's coffin. It just tore your heart out. 
You can't ask a child to have to contain all of those intense emotions and not think that later on, those feelings are going to need to be dealt with. Even an untroubled childhood can lead to a messy young adulthood. As Harry got older, he gained a reputation for being a rebel and a globe-trotting party boy. Harry's wild years throughout his 20s are well documented, um, from skirmishes with the paparazzi in public, to a costume party where he came dressed as a Nazi. Um, it just was endless. But today we know that all the sort of rowdy times were kind of a last hurrah before he left um, for his service. Harry went from party boy to action hero when he joined the military, where he served for 10 years, including two tours of Afghanistan. He thrived in that environment. Perhaps it was a relief for him being able to step away from the spotlight. He was a particularly skilled Apache helicopter pilot and gunner and rose to the rank of captain. During the military, he was able to get out of the public eye. He was able to be one of the guys. And that really allowed him an opportunity to blossom in a way that he hadn't when he felt a little bit more repressed in the royal family. This is when we really began to see Harry coming into his own. And, you know, watching him fly helicopters in his camo, I mean, you know, this is when he starts to kind of rise as maybe the most sought after bachelor in the world. Harry was always a big hit with the ladies, and some of his romantic liaisons have been with businesswoman Chelsea Davy and British model Cressida Davis, who is actually a descendant of King Charles II. Harry certainly had a busy dating life, but once he started dating someone, the whole spotlight of being in the royal family came down on them, and they couldn't handle it. Two of his biggest relationships ended because the girls couldn't stand being in that media glare. So single again, the most eligible bachelor in the world was looking for love. But going back a little further, what about some of Harry's ancestors and their love lives? The path to royal romance has never been a particularly easy one, unless you were King Henry VIII. He set up his own religion just so he could divorce his first wife. Divorce was strictly forbidden by the Pope in those days, so Hank VIII set up the Church of England in 1534 and made himself the boss. With that technicality out of the way, he went ahead and married five more times. But he had two of his wives, Anne Boleyn and Catherine Howard, beheaded. In 1937, King Edward VIII married Wallace Simpson. Not just a commoner, an American. And if that wasn't bad enough, she was a divorcee. And like Henry VIII, who did what the heck he liked, Eddie's problem was that the Church of England didn't allow people to remarry if their ex-spouses were still alive. This was like an episode of Jerry Springer, and it provoked a constitutional crisis. Poor old Eddie had to abdicate. That's a lot to give up, especially when Mrs. Simpson was also seeing a married car mechanic called Guy Trundle. I promise you, we're not making this up. But rumors were she'd learned some tricks in a house of ill repute, which sounds thrilling, if rather tiring. If you wish to marry a commoner, you may end up with a morganatic marriage or left-handed marriage, an unevenly socially balanced marriage where the royal's titles and privileges don't extend to the spouse or offspring. It's a bit like flying, way easier to downgrade than upgrade. That law got changed for William and Kate, by the way. Now, Princess Margaret discovered that when she fell for Peter Townsend, a married man. Her sister, the Queen, told her she could marry him, but she'd lose all her titles and privileges. She decided to hang on to them and dump him, which feels extremely fierce and badass for 1960. Good choice, Madge. It goes to show that the path to true love is never easy, especially if you are marrying into the royal family, and Meghan would face her own challenges. Coming up... It was a very bold move, him standing up and protecting his girlfriend at the time and saying, I'm not standing for this. did this love story begin between Meghan and Harry? Well, it wasn't through a dating app. Instead, they were set up the old-fashioned way. Harry and Meghan met through a mutual friend in July 2016, and they had a blind date at an exclusive members club in London. 
I didn't know much about him. And so the only thing that I had asked her when she said she wanted to set us up was, I had one question. I said, well, is he nice? And it seems the stars aligned. Hello, I'm world famous astrologer, Angel Idealism. I have cast what's known as the Davidson chart of Harry Windsor and Meghan Markle. In essence, you take two individual astrological charts and you mesh them into one chart and you interpret it as one chart. What's well, interesting, while I'm looking at Harry's chart, I wouldn't automatically say, oh, here's a royal. Saturn is where we have approach avoidance. I want it, I don't want it. I'm gonna eat that muffin, I'm not gonna eat that muffin. So he has it on his power seat and Saturn rules authority figures. So he's, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. I wanna be an authority figure, I don't wanna be an authority figure. Meghan Markle with loads of sparkle. So she does have Venus in Virgo, which is a difficult Venus position. Venus in Virgo is, I love you, comma, but your feet are stinky. I love you, comma, but I know you're a royal, but could you not be? <laughs> They're so bloody good together because Harry is a Virgo. And of course, Meghan has Venus in Virgo. So when somebody's Venus is on your sun, it's like you meet and it's love at first sight. So it's all or nothing, do or die. A yes is a yes, a no is a no, a maybe is why the heck we're still talking. They are quite naturally a revolutionary coupling. After a handful of dates, things moved quickly, and Prince Harry invited Meghan to accompany him on a trip to Botswana in Africa. Classic fourth date move. We, we camped out with each other under the stars. We spent just coming and jolly for five days out there, which was absolutely fantastic. So then we were really by ourselves, mm -hmm. um, which, I, which was crucial to me to make sure that we had a, a chance to, to get to know each other. Yeah. Harry and Meghan were doing real life sleepless in London and Toronto at the time. Meghan's living in Toronto where she has this busy career on suits. Harry, of course, based in London. Like anyone knows, long distance relationships aren't easy, but they found a way to make frequent trips to see each other as much as possible. For the first few months of their dating life, they were able to enjoy their secret love affair away from the glare of the media. But their relationship leaked out on October the 31st, 2016, with news Harry was dating an American actress. There's a misconception that because I have worked in the entertainment industry that this would be something I would be familiar with. But even though I've been on my show for I guess six years at that point, and working before that, I've never been part of tabloid culture. I've never been in pop culture to that degree and, and lived a relatively quiet life. The British tabloids were incredibly harsh to Meghan. They used racially tinged language to describe her. They felt like she was a money grabber, a social climber, that she was doing this to be famous. The treatment of Meghan echoed how his mother, Diana, had been harassed and hunted by the press. But this time, he was in a position to do something about it. The royal family is famously tight-lipped when it comes to talking about stories in the media. But on the 8th of November, 2016, Kensington Palace issued a statement that showed Harry's true feelings and anger at the situation. That was one of the first signs, really, that Harry wasn't like the other royals, that he was not going to be put in a box and to just accept what the situation was. It was a very bold move, him standing up and protecting his girlfriend at the time and saying, I'm not standing for this. But also, Megan was in love. She was going to do what she had to do to be there for him and to kind of deal, because you could tell this was not something that was taken lightly for her either. She took this relationship very seriously, which is clearly why she stuck around. Away from the headlines, this starry-eyed couple kept moving forward. Meghan and Harry's first public appearance on the world stage was at the Invictus Games, an international sporting event set up by the Prince for injured soldiers. They walked in uh, to the stadium hand in hand, and it was clear that this was someone special in his life, and he was making it known to everyone. The couple were totally at ease with each other and very natural. We saw early on just how happy they were together, and part of that was through how they were breaking royal protocol. They would touch hands, we would see a little PDA, and all of that was so relatable and approachable and just made us root for the two of them that this was gonna work. Soon, Megan started reprioritizing her life. She um, shut down her um, social media site, The Tig, 
She walks away from Hollywood. Which kind of had the hands of the palace saying, OK, if you're going to be a princess, then we need to get all of these things in order. After weeks of anticipation, the world finally got the news they had been waiting for. On November 27th, 2017, Meghan and Harry announced their royal engagement. It was official. The couple, thrilled and happy to be engaged, greeted the media as a united front at the official photo call at Kensington Palace. Was it romantic? <laughs> They walked out um, in Buckingham Palace to a place called the Sunken Garden. This was a garden that was really special. It was a favorite spot of um, Harry's late mother, Princess Diana. So it was a nice homage to her, a nice way of including her in the moment. You could just really feel the love radiating off of them. And it was the first moment that we saw the ring. So it was a beautiful, enormous diamond ring, the center stone is from Botswana. And then the two outside stones were from Princess Diana's collection, so including Harry's late mother in this moment. They released a beautiful set of photos that were really stunning. But even then, some of the press point out things chipping away at Meghan, pointing out ridiculous things that she wasn't wearing tights and this wasn't um, following royal protocol, which is just kind of ridiculous and archaic. Harry and Meghan's natural way with each other, this ease that they have was apparent from the start, especially during this engagement announcement, holding hands, looking up at each other, all smiles, um, very comfortable with each other. And this was a stark contrast to the engagement announcement that we saw from Harry's mother and father, uh, Diana and Charles, where it seemed uncomfortable and slightly awkward. Can you, can you find? The words to sum up how you feel today, both of you. Difficult to find mm. that sort of word, isn't it, really? Just delighted and, and happy. And I, I, I'm amazed that she's uh, been brave enough to take me on. <laughs> and I suppose in love. Of course. <laughs> Whatever in love means. <laughs> And while he must have endured a refreshed grief as he reflected on his mother not meeting Meghan, he said that they would have got along smashingly. They'd be thick as thieves, <laughs> <laughs> without question. I think she would be over the moon, jumping up and down, you know, so excited for, for me. But then, as I said, we'd have probably been best friends, best friends with Meghan. Uh, she's with us. I'm sure she's with us, yeah, you know, jumping up and down somewhere else. Coming up. Meghan and Harry's wedding was like a wedding that the royal family had never seen before. It's just like more glamorous than the Oscars. The world had been holding its breath, waiting to find out when Meghan and Harry would be tying the knot. It was finally announced that the couple would get married on May the 19th, 2018. A royal wedding is the ultimate in pomp and pageantry. Royal fans just delight in a royal wedding. I mean, it's like, it's the fairy tale. The royal wedding is Cinderella's castle, Prince Charming, all of that rolled up into one. And like so many decisions in this couple's life, they chose a different kind of royal wedding from their predecessors. The average wedding in America these days costs around $35,000, which seems like a lot and a pretty compelling case for a drive through off the main drag in Vegas. The most recent royal weddings have become much more fancy schmancy affairs. I mean, maybe not Kim Kardashian fancy, maybe not Elton and David pink champagne and caviar fancy, but in terms of cost, royal weddings win every time. Will and Kate's wedding cost $34 million in 2011. The prize went up again for Harry and Meghan's wedding. That cost around $45 million. Sibling rivalry or just a lot of transatlantic flights? One of the most expensive royal weddings ever was in Monaco. Prince Albert II married Charlene Whitstock. That was about $70 million. But have you ever been to Monaco? A cheeseburger is like 40 bucks. It's ridiculous. Even that, there was nothing compared to Harry's dad. In 1981, nearly a billion people watched as Diana Spencer married Prince Charles. And if you adjust for inflation, it costs somewhere between 70 and $110 million. But for all that, today's royal weddings seem like lavish affairs. Most of the budget goes on security. Right, back to Miss Markle. 
As Harry's bride, she provoked controversy not only as the first American to join the royal family, but the first biracial person to marry into it. Meghan had her own ideas of how she wanted her wedding day to be different. Harry and Meghan chose to have theirs at Windsor Castle in St. George's Cathedral, which is almost 700 years old and the final resting place of Henry VIII. On the day, millions of people from around the world tuned in to watch the ceremony. Oh, because this is history. This is a very important moment. It was a truly glittering and international affair. Meghan and Harry's wedding was like a wedding that the royal family had never seen before. It was Hollywood meets royalty. You'll be watching and you're like, oh my God, there's Oprah, there's George Clooney, there's Idris Elba, there's the Beckhams. It's just like, there was just so many celebrities because they weren't just coming from Meghan. Harry had grown up with a mother who was very friendly with celebrities. This was like more glamorous than the Oscars. As with all weddings, tensions were running high. The media reported rumors that during the preparations for the wedding, a rift began between the Cambridges and the Sussexes. There was reportedly one dust up between Meghan and Kate during a fitting for Princess Charlotte's uh, little bridesmaid dress, where they had a disagreement and Kate ended up in tears. And of course, we have to keep in mind, this was very soon after Prince Louis was born. A source explained that Kate was still very emotional. There had been a lot of stress around the wedding and around the planning. On the wedding day, Meghan traveled to Windsor Castle through the procession route with her mother, Doria, by her side. Everybody was waiting with bated breath to see what Meghan's wedding dress would look like. Would it be some over-the-top, grand, poofy princess dress like Princess Diana? Would it be this sort of elegant, sophisticated, lace, long sleeve look like Kate Middleton? It was neither of those things. She had a very simple, tailored, streamlined dress. I mean, this really was understated. She was just impeccable, modern, an entirely new version of a princess. Only a few days before, Meghan had been due to walk down the aisle with her father, Thomas, but he then announced that he would not be at the ceremony due to his recovery from heart surgery. And of course, the media went to town on the divisions within her family. Anytime there's a big wedding where family's coming together, there's a lot of potential for strife and stress. And then came the question, who would walk Meghan down the aisle and what's going to happen now that her father is not there? She made a real groundbreaking move in deciding to walk the first steps by herself, um, which really showed that this was a strong, independent woman who was making the decision to step into this life on her own. And then she was greeted by her father-in-law, future king of England. Um, Prince Charles stepped in to walk Meghan partially down the aisle. There's no greater compassion and, and love for a future daughter-in-law than to take her by the hand to lead her to Harry to get married. I think a lot of people, even for those of us at People Magazine on staff watching, felt like, how is she so calm? You know, she was almost preternaturally serene. Later, when I spoke with her friends, they said, that's who Meg is. When she's in the moment, she's really in it. When she's made choices, she believes them 100%. And so there was nothing for her to be nervous about. And I thought that was really extraordinary. As the star-studded congregation looked on, Meghan's pastor, Michael Curry, delivered an impassioned sermon about love. Imagine this tired old world when love is, is the way, when, when love is the way. A far cry from the usual stuffy speeches, the ever-observant media caught Kate Middleton giving Camilla, Duchess of Cornwall, the side eye. Let no one put us under. All was saved when the newlyweds delivered what we had all been waiting for. Meghan and Harry fall in tradition by having their first kiss in public when they step outside of the church. It was really the sort of like big PDA moment between the couple. The crowd went 
absolutely wild. It felt like it could just be your friend's wedding and they happened to be really in love, but it happened to be something that millions of people were watching. So it was that authenticity and that genuine love that really came across just as all of their other public moments had brought. That day, the couple received a new title from the Queen, Duke and Duchess of Sussex, and their new life began. Coming up, they really felt protective of this new baby and wanting to make sure he had as much privacy as he possibly could from the very start. The start of Harry and Meghan's life was exciting and as newlyweds, they moved into Kensington Palace, right next door to Will and Kate. In the summer of 2018, Meghan and Harry are settling into newlywed life. She stepped into not only a new family, but a whole new country. So they're just kind of established in their footing as a married couple. Meghan had done a great job being accepted into the royal family, and even the usually reserved queen took a shine to her new granddaughter-in-law. The queen herself wanted to show how much she was eager to welcome Meghan into the royal fold. And she did that by giving Meghan a ticket on board the royal train, which is how the queen likes to travel. And in fact, you really felt that they had this, this chemistry between them. And Meghan was bringing new, new life and new joy to these outings. Meghan and Harry began their royal duties as Duke and Duchess of Sussex. But what exactly is a duchess anyway, and where do they fit into the whole royalty ladder? So, according to tradition or Henry VIII, you have a god at the top of the heap, well, Nat, then an emperor, then a high king or queen, then a king or queen, then come your archdukes, grand princes and princesses, grand dukes and duchesses, then come your crown prince. And I mean, we're really climbing a long way down the ladder here, aren't we? After all, them come duke and duchess. Fun fact, Meghan could actually be a duke. This isn't anything to do with which bathroom she uses. A woman can be called Duke too. What about Harry, though? Well, he's a Duke of Sussex and also Earl of Dumbarton and Baron Kilkeel. The Duke and Duchess titles are kind of like a wedding present from the Queen. Here you go. I wasn't sure which toast you wanted, so I got you Hampshire instead. The annoying thing about being Duke or Duchess of Sussex is there's no Duchy or Territory of Sussex. Whereas Charles, Harry's dad, is Duke of Cornwall and also gets the Duchy of Cornwall, which literally means if you live in Cornwall, he could well be your landlord. Although it won't be him coming and fixing your broken toilet, but he does get the cash from owning it. And like Cornwall, there's no Duchy of Sussex and therefore no cash. So they don't get the cash, and guess what else Meghan doesn't have? Legal custody of her son, Archie. According to a law from 1717, the Queen actually has governance over all the royal sprogs, including Will and Kate. You might think it doesn't really have any relevance today, but apparently decisions like which members of the royal family are allowed to get on the same plane, yup, the Queen makes that call. Back to the couple's first royal tour of Australia, Tonga and New Zealand. Meghan and Harry were an instant hit with the public. And this is where we get to see Meghan shine. And there was a lot of echoes of Princess Diana in terms of her really bonding with people, with children, with a lot of the locals, um, giving speeches, which is something we hadn't seen Kate do before with such ease. Meghan was compared to Diana in another way, as a world fashion icon. Diana led the way in setting trends in the world of fashion. Back in the 80s, everybody wanted the Diana cut, and she occupied a fashion arena that included Audrey Hepburn, Jackie Kennedy, and some of the other most stylish women in history. When Princess Diana was alive, she was, without a doubt, one of the most photographed women in the world. Diana brought an innate glamour and, and this beauty to the royal family. It took them from royals to pretty much celebrities, all because of her and just this endless interest and curiosity in all things Diana. In 2019, Meghan was named the most powerful fashion icon and the term the Meghan effect was coined. Like most people, I love Meghan Markle's style. 
We like to say at People that everything Megan touches turns to sold. And that's because when Megan wears something, it translates into mega sales for the brand. In one of those tours, she actually wore a bag by Strathbury. The second she wore this bag, it sold out in 11 seconds. The Duke and Duchess of Sussex were in the honeymoon phase. The tour of Australia kicked off with some bombshell news. Uh, the couple arrived into Sydney uh, telling the world that they were expecting their first child. It was the most exciting way of kicking off a royal tour. This is a moment that the public, the entire world was excited about. Anytime there's a royal wedding, you wait for the announcement about the royal baby. This was massive news in the royal world and for fans. I mean, it was almost, it was almost too much to process. It was all happening at once. At the same time, we also noticed that Meghan and Harry are wanting to kind of put up the walls because they really felt protective of, of this new baby and wanting to make sure he had as much privacy as he possibly could um, from the very start. Weeks before the baby was born, Harry and Meghan announced they intended to keep the plans surrounding their child's birth private. It was never announced where Meghan planned to give birth. This was a major change from Kate's birth plans. Kate, obviously, at the Lindo Wing in Paddington, every single time one of her children is born, the crowds are gathered outside, you know, the news teams are there. It's a very big global event. With royal births, we famously see the new happy parents step out of the hospital. For royal fans, there's an expectation that we would be kind of, I don't know, almost included in that. And we learned pretty early on that Meghan and Harry were not going to do this. On May the 6th, 2019, baby Sussex arrived, weighing in at seven pounds, three ounces. And it wasn't actually until the birth certificate of Archie was released that we even knew what hospital they had gone to. Megan said no way was she going to walk out of a hospital and into uh, a crowd of, of thousands, you know, with every TV camera from all over the world there, which is what Kate did. But Kate felt that that was her duty. Megan didn't feel it was her duty, um, so she didn't do it. They didn't want involvement from the press. They wanted to do it their way. This was not a baby for the public. This was their baby. The first of a newly born Lord Prince on this, the shortest day, 2018. It does seem a normal thing for a father to protect his child and to be able to do what he wants and release photos when he wants. But the British public have a very different perception of this. They pay for the royal family. So there was a lot of resentment towards Harry when he started to restrict this access. I think the christening marked a bit of a turning point where it was, no, this is a private event. We're not going to bring you know, cameras in. We're not gonna release dozens of photos. That was a shift that a lot of people had to get used to. Meghan, Harry and baby Archie then moved away from Kensington Palace to Frogmore Cottage in Windsor. Well, Harry said that he, he felt like a prisoner in Kensington Palace. He couldn't wait to get out of there. The Queen offered them Frogmore Cottage, but it was in a very dilapidated state. And unfortunately for Harry and Meghan, the bill fell on the taxpayer and it was uh, 2.4 million pounds. And that caused a, a lot of bad feeling as well. The public started to feel like this quid pro quo was, was off kilter. Like, well, you know, if we're helping pay for, I don't know, your new kitchen, we should get to see, um, you know, Archie on his special day. Meghan and Harry, they wanted to be royal and to enjoy the royal life, but they also wanted a private life. And those two don't really go together. Coming up. It was the first time that a member of the British royal family has done anything like that. There's more to being royal than cutting ribbons and waving. There are very strict rules and protocols that must be followed. My name is Micah Meyer, and I'm the founder of Beaumont Etiquette. My training was very formal. It was done in London under a former member of the Queen of England's household staff. 
I think there's this heightened level of fascination when we all saw Meghan Markle marry into the royal family. We were like, wait, a real average person can become a real royal? In our minds, we just saw her go from A to B, but that definitely wouldn't have been the case. She would have been, you know, practicing in royal aids, would have literally guided her throughout the entire process. Behind the scenes, she had to basically, in essence, join a royal training camp of how to become a royal. For instance, when you're addressing the queen, she is Her Majesty, um, and after that, it's just ma'am, rhymes with jam. And it's always a curtsy, especially in public. Megan, we saw it for the first time on TV. We were cheering her on, and the lower and the deeper her curtsy went, the more confident she became. And so we can see her confidence in her training kind of evolve. A lot of etiquette around the royal wife, and we actually see how she starts on that day that she was first engaged, and you know, she's waving and very excited. And then we see her at the next event, and suddenly we see her fingers are together. And then we see that elbow come in even further. And then we see the polished wave in the end. Even the sitting position, that's one huge part of Megan's training, we literally saw happen before our eyes. We see the old Megan, and she would have one leg crossed over the other and her ankle kind of out and, and you know, flapping about in a very casual way, which is very comfortable. As she becomes a royal, we see her training go into effect. That first big event where she's sitting next to the queen, she's using this new technique. She has one over the other, toes pointing forward, and it's so tight. It's almost like there's a rubber band from her knees to her ankles. And if you tried to slip a little credit card in between her legs, good luck. You wouldn't have gotten it through. Can imagine how intimidating that first session of afternoon tea with the queen must have been. Holding a teacup is, is actually even harder than it looks. You actually pinch your fingers together through the teacup, and then you use your middle finger underneath it. And if you want to support the teacup, you can use two fingers, like the Duchess of Cambridge does, at the very bottom. Knowing what she went through, how fast she went through that training, that's not typical for a royal. And she really did a good job. But Meghan hasn't always been so obedient. And when she started tearing up the royal rule book, her newly universal adoration and shine began to fade. One of the ways that we see Meghan and Harry start to bend some rules, maybe even start to break some rules, was when Meghan guest edited Vogue. Unlike previous royal princesses' involvement with Vogue, Meghan didn't just pose for the magazine. In fact, she didn't put herself on the cover. She celebrated women around the world who are doing uh, extraordinary things. It was called Forces for Change and included interviews with everyone from Jane Fonda to Greta Thunberg. It was the first time that a member of the British royal family has done anything like that. This move was seen as too political by some critics who saw this as kind of an inappropriate royal role for her and, and not what we had been used to seeing. There's an interview between Meghan and Michelle Obama and Michelle Obama gives her some advice about how to handle fame and the royal family. Usually, you don't get outside advice. The palace is what gives you the guidance that you need to go forward. That didn't really go over well with some people. Yet again, Meghan was feeling the backlash from the world around her. Humans fear change, and in this situation, there was a lot of change going on. The aristocracy and the monarchy is a stuffy institution. Meghan came in and she was completely different. She was an American, she was biracial, she was a divorcee. I think there could have been some fear that she is something other and that she could affect the monarchy and chip away at the monarchy. You know, I think in some ways, what Meghan and Harry have done is just shown, listen, we're gonna do what's right for us. We are going to do what we are comfortable with. Meghan and Harry are not the only royals to have a rebellious streak. There's a long line of royal rebels, but there are those who know how to make it work for them. What about Princess Margaret, the Queen's sister? Hmm, she liked to party. She partied hard with her daughter's godfather, Anthony Barton, with a former Prime Minister's nephew, Alex Douglas Horn, and it's thought she even partied with Mick Jagger and Warren Beatty. She partied hard in her party house on the party island of Mustique. But then she calmed down and got herself a toy boy, marrying a guy 17 years younger than her. Then she got the first royal divorce since 1901. She rocks. But if you ask us, the royal rebel closest to Meghan's heart 
would probably be Princess Louise, Queen Victoria's fourth daughter. She questioned everything, earning her the nickname Little Miss Y. She was very cool. She refused to marry someone she didn't love, was an ardent feminist, and visited imprisoned suffragettes, the protesters for equal rights for women. And, stop me if this sounds familiar, she got married and moved to Canada. Her full name? Louisa Caroline Alberta, and yup, yeah, Alberta Canada is named after her. The province was originally going to be called Louise. If you can find a more Megan-friendly royal rebel than that, then you can send us to the Tower for treason. Coming up... It was a huge betrayal for Prince Harry and Meghan, and they let it be known. They filed suit. As a member of the royal family, the press can either be a valuable asset or your worst enemy. And Prince Harry and Meghan have maintained a love-hate relationship with them. There have been times when the royals have welcomed the press in terms of trying to get their messages out. And this can be anything from obviously, you know, the Royal Rota, which is the established UK press corps, attending their engagements, which are to benefit charity, to shine a light on, on good causes. And that's the time when they really embrace the press. Even Harry's mother, Diana, used the media to her advantage. Princess Diana famously used back channels to set up an interview with the BBC's Martin Bashir on the show Panorama. And she did that because she felt that she could not make her side of the story heard. When no one listens to you, or you feel no one's listening to you, all sorts of things start to happen. For instance, you have so much pain inside yourself that you try and hurt yourself on the outside because you want help, but it's the wrong help you're asking for. People see it as crying wolf or attention seeking. And they think because you're in the media all the time, you've got enough attention, inverted commas. But I was actually crying out because I wanted to get better. We have never seen any royal open up the way Diana did, the way she bared her innermost thoughts and feelings. But unlike Diana, Meghan was too new to royal life to start airing her grievances publicly. But her friends would rally to the cause. In an exclusive interview with People magazine, Meghan's inner circle opened up about the Duchess's private life and her struggles with the UK tabloids. In February of 2019, Meghan's inner circle of friends felt that they could no longer remain silent well, what they saw as global bullying of Meghan was unfolding. They wanted to speak out and they came to People Magazine to do that. What I heard from them was that nobody celebrates your wins bigger than Meghan. And by the same token, when you're struggling, Meghan is there with a box of Kleenex and a bottle of wine, anything she can do to comfort and support you. And, you know, they talked about another misconception that Meghan is so high maintenance. There was a report that Meghan wanted the church sprayed the specific scent, and it was sort of diva moment. And the friend said, Meghan, is so religious, she would never, ever disrespect a holy place like St. George's Chapel at Windsor Castle, and that that's a contradiction to who she is. I came away feeling like my friendships are really <laughs> inferior to, to Megan's because these women, they felt so loved by her and supported in a way I had really never seen before. Megan got a little help from her friends, but it was short-lived. Later that month, the Daily Mail ran an article that for Meghan and Harry crossed the line. There was a major issue with the Mail on Sunday that published a letter, a private letter, that Meghan had sent to her father. It was a huge betrayal for Prince Harry and Meghan, and they let it be known. They filed suit. She obviously feels like it's a, a copyright issue that they went ahead and posted that letter without her permission. The action was accompanied by a scathing statement from Prince Harry denouncing the media's bullying of his wife. This clearly goes back to his anger and his hurt at how his mother was treated. Days later, Prince Harry sued the owners of The Sun and Daily Mirror for allegedly hacking his voicemails. They're both very much taking a stand against the UK press, against the tabloid intrusion that they feel has 
completely compromised their ability to have a private life. So who are the tabloids? If you're even slightly famous and you're in Europe, the chances are whatever you're doing, someone is going to be taking a photograph of you. They're pretty aggressive with how they get their scoops. A famous scandal was Squidgy Gate. A British newspaper got hold of a recording of Princess Diana and a close friend, James Gilby, speaking on the phone. In the calls, Gilby calls Diana either Squidge or Squidgy 53 times. Try calling me that once, I dare you. There's always been a degree of push and pull with the press. Let's not forget the British royal family is paid for by British people. They help fund their lavish lifestyle. So what the royals get up to is very much in the public interest. Now, poor Meghan has felt the sharp end and the coverage of her life in Kate Middleton is astonishing. For Kate, not long to go, pregnant Kate tenderly cradles her baby bump. For Meghan, why can't Meghan Markle keep her hands off her bump? Is it pride, vanity, acting, or a new age bonding technique? For Kate, Kate's morning sickness cure, Prince William gifted with an avocado for pregnant Duchess. For Meghan, Meghan Markle's beloved avocado linked to human rights abuse and drought. One thing's for sure, pics of the royal family mean cash, so watch out for that long lens, Meghan and Harry. Coming up. People were saying, is this gonna work out? Are they gonna be able to stick this out? Because it's not looking good. As media scrutiny intensified, so did tensions inside the royal family. This was a turning point for Prince Harry and Meghan when it came to them just not putting up with the British press anymore. You would think that, you know, the royal family would step out and, and, and make some sort of decree or something um, in their support, and it didn't happen. And you start to see not only the shift between Prince Harry and, and Meghan and the press, but a little bit of a shift between them and their family. There were some tensions going on behind the scenes. I think what happens with any family is that an outsider, someone else comes in, they marry a member of the family, and the dynamic changes. Things were maybe not as copacetic as they seemed. Things were sort of strained. People obviously looked into a lot of this, and what appears to be at the root of it is a division between the brothers, William and Harry. Tensions between Harry and William had apparently been growing for some time. What had happened is Prince William had confronted his brother in the run-up to Meghan and Harry's wedding. And he just questioned him about, do you think she's the right girl for you, effectively? Is she the right person for this job? That went down badly with Harry. We understand was obviously quite angry. But Harry never forgot that. That started a rift that has had only deepened. They were never able to really heal from that uh, initial disagreement. Harry and William have always had a particularly unique bond as siblings. Let's explore the brothers' relationship a little bit deeper. William and Harry were born just over two years apart. They were close as children, and as they grew up in a family where roles and status mean everything, it was inevitably going to put a strain on even the tightest brotherly relationship. In royal circles, children are often referred to as the heir and the spare. The eldest is destined to be king, while the younger one can end up feeling a little redundant. For William to take a leap like Harry's would be almost unthinkable. He has a lot of skin in the game. He's going to be the freaking king, after all. But the pressure on him to stay would be impossible to resist. Harry, by contrast, does spare, has a little more wiggle room. One thing's for sure, they're both dealing with massive adjustments to their lives, so it's anyone's guess what the brothers' relationship will look like moving forward. Meanwhile, Kate and Meghan were dealing with their own issues. I think we all wanted Meghan and Kate to be best friends because we love Kate and we love Meghan and it was, okay, now we have two of them. But they're so different. They grew up completely different and they have different roles now. So when they didn't really seem to become best friends, people started thinking that they were frenemies. And the tabloids went crazy setting them up against each other. Any new mom can understand the value of calling a girlfriend and having someone over to help you out and figure out this new role as a mother. 
And Megan was very isolated. She was starting anew without the support system that most of us have when we enter this new chapter of our lives. So you had Megan having trouble settling into rural life. Kate is not able to necessarily be that support. And Harry and William not talking very much anymore. So the two couples became estranged. It was on a tour to South Africa that Harry and Meghan seemed to finally reach a breaking point. When they were in South Africa, they recorded a documentary with ITV, and it was really the most personal we've ever seen Harry and Meghan be. They had a film crew following them, and this really was the first time that they were honest about how they felt. They did an interview with Tom Bradby, who is a TV journalist. He has, over the years, become quite close to Harry and, and become a sort of spokesperson for Harry. And he interviewed them, and Harry was amazingly open. You're living in this goldfish bowl. The interest is huge. The pressure is great. I mean, do you want to talk me through the last year and where you're at? Look, part of this job and part of any job, like everybody, um, means putting on a brave face and turning a, turning a cheat to a lot of the stuff. But again, for me and for, and for my wife, you know, there's a, there's a, of course there's a lot of stuff that hurts. They felt that they were in isolation, and they also felt that they had no support when it came to all these things that they were uniquely dealing with. Another huge moment in that documentary was where Megan spoke out about how she was feeling. You could tell that she had been struggling in her role as a new royal and as a new mom. It's obviously an area one has to tiptoe into very gently, but I don't know what the impact on your physical and mental health of all the pressure that you clearly feel under. Um, I would say, look, any woman when they're, especially when they're pregnant, you're really vulnerable. You add this on top of just trying to be a new mom or trying to be a newlywed, it's, um, and also thank you for asking, because not many people have asked if I'm okay, but it's, um, it's a very real thing to be going through behind the scenes. I think Megan was really sending a message direct to camera saying, I need help here. This is a difficult situation. When she says not a lot of people have asked if I'm OK, she's not really referring to the public or fans who, who support her. She didn't feel members of the royal family had asked if she was OK. People were saying, is this going to work out? Are they going to be able to stick this out? Because it's not looking good. The Sussexes were looking for a happy and authentic life, and they needed to find a solution, however drastic. Coming up. When Harry and Meghan made this announcement, the world was stunned. Remember those moments in history that changed the world? The first moon landing. The assassination of John F. Kennedy. The first time we saw Kermit the Frog's legs. So weird. And when Harry and Meghan decided to leave the royal family. A royal announcement that is sure to rock the United Kingdom. Royal split. Harry and Meghan quit. Going it alone, the Duke and Duchess of Sussex. The royal family reeling this morning. A rift in the royal family, not seen for a generation. I remember exactly where I was when I heard the news that they were leaving. I was sitting in my office at People. I think I was just running around the office, going from office to office, saying this is going to be the biggest story of a decade. I feel like we were in a meeting and we were like, wait, what? The rest of the royals didn't even know it until 10 minutes before they put this statement out. On the 8th of January 2020, a statement was released from the Duke and Duchess that they were stepping down from royal life. They did it on social media of all places. So right away, we were kind of all scrambling to keep up. It's on Sussex Royal, and is there going to be more coming? And who's going to answer the questions? I can't even imagine the chaos in the palace on that day. The poor queen, she's 93 years old, and now this, one of her favorite grandsons, now stepping back from royal life, and what does that even mean? 
News like this usually goes through the royal communications team, goes through the queen. There is a long list of steps you take before this goes out to the public. So why did Meghan and Harry hastily make this announcement? I think part of this rush decision on their part was because the story had actually already been leaked to the Sun newspaper. They were running it the following day, and from what sources tell me, they were forced into releasing their own statement. Harry and Meghan felt that when the news leaked, to the Sun newspaper, they had no choice but to try and get out ahead of it. So suddenly this train had completely left the station and everyone was kind of struggling to keep up. I think it was a bad decision on Harry and Meghan's behalf to rush out this document without checking with the royal family. You don't change your decision making and go against the Queen just because some scrappy journalist in London um, has, is saying that they've got a story. There had been rumors that Harry and Meghan had been in discussions with members of the royal family about leaving the monarchy, but this surprise announcement was a stunning reveal for all parties involved. It is a bit of a soap opera, but I mean, quite frankly, the things that have happened recently, you just simply, you couldn't write it. You can hardly imagine how difficult that talk must have been between Harry and Meghan about what they were going to do. They've put Archie down to sleep, and they are trying to figure out how to walk away from one of the most important families in the world. Meghan and Harry have not been the only royals to drop a bombshell. Being royal is a high-stakes game, and if we look to the past, Meghan and Harry are not alone in causing a few royal eyebrows to be raised. Good old Chuck and Cammy, Charles and Camilla, first met in 1971, but waited 34 years to get married. In that intervening time, Charles married and divorced Princess Diana. There was an infamous moment when they were asked, and are you in love? Diana replied, of course, and Charles drawled, whatever love means. 15 years later, it was all over. In the meantime, Camilla had married and divorced Andrew Parker Bells, but they didn't exactly wait until their wedding night to hook up. They were still married, but it was to the reported approval of Camilla's first husband who knew all about it. In fact, a recording of a phone call between Charles and Camilla got leaked, which is far, far beyond what you might call a bit saucy. We'll let you look that one up for yourselves. This is a family show, people. So in the grand scheme of things, Harry and Meghan's bombshell seems pretty tame by comparison. The media, having felt kept at arm's length, went into a frenzy. The British press and um, social media very quickly coined the phrase Megxit, which is really quite misogynistic. It's blaming the fact that Meghan and Harry are leaving the royal family on the woman. The British press is always blaming Meghan. They've done that from the beginning. Whatever Meghan and Harry do that they don't like, it's Meghan's fault. From a tabloid media standpoint, Meghan became the focus of she's the one driving this decision. But anyone who really knows Harry knows that he has expressed a desire to step away from royal life from, from the beginning. There were times in his 20s where he kind of lamented at this role that he's in and hinted at that he would love to have a, a life outside of the royal family. So if anything, he's the one propelling this decision and Meghan's supporting him. But I think we know now this is a decision they made as a couple. They're very much a family unit. You know, we know they have a great relationship and that they're doing things that they think are best for their entire family. This had to be something that really weighed on them. But what must have weighed on them more was what they had been through for them to make the decision to leave the royal family, to leave the Windsors. I mean, it's a dream for so many people. And they decided to just walk away. Coming up. Something like this could bring down the monarchy. This was panic stations for the royal family. After the bombshell was dropped, all royal parties had to scramble to determine what would happen next. 
something like this could bring down the monarchy. This was panic stations for the royal family. Buckingham Palace did release a statement, and I think this was a big shock to the world. It was obvious from that statement that they weren't on the same page. The discussions are still ongoing. We know they are expressing an interest to do this, but all the details haven't been worked out yet. The thing is, you don't announce the plan until you know what the plan is, right? They did things back to front. By now, Meghan had already gone to Canada. A 93-year-old Queen Elizabeth had to spring into action and implement damage control for the monarchy. The Queen and her senior advisors did some very quick thinking. They said that they were going to have a summit at Sandringham. She had Charles and William and Harry all meet her there, and then they sat down to talk it out. The pressure on the Queen here is immense. The Queen was on her back foot. She is under pressure to be the leader and to have an answer and to have a path forward, and the clock is ticking. Within days, on January the 13th, 2020, the Queen publicly announced a declaration of her blessing for the couple. Five days later, the Queen released a statement that was really in support of, of Harry and Meghan's decision. And this was one of the most emotional statements we had ever seen from the Queen since the death of Princess Diana. She used terms like, my grandson, my family. We're not used to seeing those sort of terms of endearment coming from the Queen. She loves Harry. She wanted to make sure that Meghan and Harry felt that they had her backing but that also helped kind of put a lid on any other gossip and drama that would immediately come out in those first few days. This is unprecedented. There were so many details to work out, so many questions. Where are they going to live? What will their titles be? Everyone wants to know how they will actually go about charting out this new life and where the money's gonna come from. What are they gonna do? But how do the royals make their money? Yes, let's talk about money. <laughs> I'm Haley Sachs, and I'm a financial pop star. The royals make their money three different ways, through inheritances, sovereign grants, and also through duchies. The sovereign grant is taxpayer money. So if you're watching this and you live in Britain, I'm sorry because you paid Meghan and Harry 130K last year just to leave your country. So yeah, you can cry about that. Basically what the duchies are is like, Prince Charles is a landlord. He's inherited these properties. They're all our properties and he's making money on them because people live there, they visit and he's pocketing the cash. Prince Charles, he gives some of that money to his sons. The Sussexes can credit 95% of their income just to Prince Harry having a rich dad. So yes, Harry has a rich dad, but he also had a rich mom. Diana didn't come from nothing. Like, she walked into the royal family with her own fat wallet. When she died, she left Prince Harry $10 million. Even though the couple quit being royals, these two are media starlets. They're not looking just for money. Really, what they're searching for with this exit is impact. Coming up. The royal family is doing the most positive things. They're putting on a great show for the British public that all is fine here, everything is good, the show will go on, the monarchy is solid. While Meghan was busy unpacking her Suits DVDs in Canada, it was back to business for the royal family. It was initially a bit of chaos as everyone tried to kind of find their footing in this new, unprecedented order of things. At the end of the day, the monarchy has to come first and the crown has to come first. The queen, she's not gonna let her emotions get the better of her. Now it's about action. It's about taking action and figuring out what our next steps. The monarchy is often throughout history in a, a very vulnerable position. There are a lot of people who don't agree with the monarchy. The monarchy can be perceived as a very undemocratic institution. 
essentially inherited power. When you have somebody who is stepping away from the royal family, this makes the royal family very vulnerable. For those that had stayed, the Queen doled out presents. Prince William was bestowed with an additional royal post, Lord High Commissioner to the Church of Scotland. The royal PR team wanted the rest of the family to show a united front, and William, Kate, Charles and Camilla embarked on a rare joint charity engagement, and the British press dubbed them the new Fab Four. All this sort of family discord and fighting amongst themselves didn't look good, so the Queen wanted to fix this up. She has Charles and Camilla and Kate and William all at her beck and call to come out and present a united front as this is the royal family, we're still here for you. The Duchess of Cambridge was also being kept busy on a tour of the UK to promote her work with childhood development. Kate has really stepped forward. She just gave her most illuminating interview that we've ever heard from her. You know, it was a podcast, a very modern format, where she talked about the challenges of motherhood, the challenges of being pregnant. So she's willing to take up this mantle and help support the monarchy any way she can. They're doing the most positive things. They're putting on a great show for the British public that all is fine here, everything is good, the show will go on, the monarchy is solid. With the royal family's united front in check, the Queen had one last ground rule that needed to be laid. What was important to the Queen was that Meghan and Harry cannot continue to use their royal titles and the trademark of Sussex Royal. She didn't want any perception of impropriety that they might be making money in any kind of way off of any royal titles. Obviously, they're known as Sussex Royal. That is their Twitter handle, their Instagram name. The whole brand is based around that. The Queen and other members of the royal family had said actually no, that word royal cannot be used. No one can say royal unless they really are royal. Once Queen Elizabeth's terms were made crystal clear, Harry knew it was time for him and Meghan to move forward with their new life. One of the things that was just so exciting to see was how they took this bold step themselves. It was world-shattering news. It made headlines the world over. Was it perfect? No. But when you kind of take control and find your voice and realize, I can make this path forward, that's a really inspiring thing to see. During Harry's final few days in the UK, he delivered an emotional exit speech at a charity dinner in London. It brings me great sadness that it has come to this. There really was no other option. It has been our privilege to serve you, and we will continue to lead a life of service. So in that respect, nothing changes. But I hope that helps you understand that I would step my family back from all I have ever known to take a step forward into what I hope can be a more peaceful life. It's a tough situation, particularly for Prince Harry, because this is his family. These are the people who have loved him and raised him and who he has grown up with his whole life. We've all been in family situations that can be complicated, but they're always a part of who we are. So I think the goal for them is to still have warm relations. I think Harry and William still want to reforge their bond, but it's gonna look very different than anything we've ever seen before. The rest of the world had their own reactions in the aftermath of the Sussex's bombshell announcement. While Harry filled a suitcase with a gold toothbrush, some monogrammed socks, and a copy of How to Succeed in Business Support was flooding in from celebrity friends and admirers. That middler hoped Meghan would bankrupt them all, although I don't quite see how she'd manage that. Oprah Winfrey said she supports them a thousand percent. And Jack Osborne observed, Listen, Prince Harry, if I can survive my family, you can survive yours. And Meghan's friend Jessica Mulroney, who previously had the sweetest babysitting gig imaginable looking after Archie, called out critics of Meghan as the racist bullies and posted this quote on Instagram after the news. A strong woman looks a challenge in the eye and gives it a wink. Wink hard, Meghan. Coming up, how is the next chapter going to unfold? The world is their oyster right now. They can pretty much do anything that they want. Harry joined his wife Meghan in Canada to start their new unprecedented post-royal life. 
it was revealed that Meghan and Harry are going to be splitting their time between the UK and Canada during this period of transition. So they set their sights on Vancouver Island, where they spent a lot of the time over the holidays. Life in Canada was pretty peaceful for the most part compared to living in London. They were in a friend's $14 million mansion in Vancouver Island, taking a lot of walks with Archie, spending a lot of family time together, doing yoga, being as healthy as they possibly can be. Canada is somewhere that Megan's very familiar with. She used to film in Toronto. But I think it's a place that she felt safe. This wasn't the spotlight of London. And they just needed somewhere calming, somewhere that they could get their thoughts together and really also heal their mental health, I think. So what are the predictions for the couple's next steps? It's brand new territory for them to be trying to find a way to basically earn money. And, you know, when you are the Prince of England and the Duchess of Sussex. It's like you, you have to earn a lot of money in order to keep up that lifestyle and to live independently. It's gonna be a really interesting road ahead. The last round of royal engagements were in March. They're officially stepping back and they'll no longer be using their HRH titles or uh, Sussex Royal. But I think the world is their oyster right now. They can pretty much do anything that they want. And both of them are very smart. Both of them are very talented. Harry and Meghan's next steps in terms of their careers is anyone's guess. Who knows whether we might see uh, a Meghan Markle clothing range for one of her women empowerment charities. We might see a book deal maybe, although various ones of those have been denied so far. We also know that Harry is involved in a TV project with Oprah for Apple TV. So that will be announced at some point this year, I'm told. We've already seen that Meghan did her first voiceover role for Disney and the check was donated to a charity for elephants they're definitely going to be cashing in on their celebrity status. There is no way they're going to be penniless. They are going to have offers coming through the door. We saw Harry and Meghan recently in Miami at this banking summit at JP Morgan. We thought they were going to be laying low. Uh, suddenly we got the news that Harry and Meghan uh, were sitting next to J-Lo and A-Rod at a star-studded event for JP Morgan. Uh, and there are rumors that Harry earned a million dollars for giving a speech at that event. It's not a bad paycheck at all, especially for your first time outside of the royal family. People are going to be offering them deals left, right, and center, but they still have to have composure and remember where they came from because ultimately they don't want to disrespect the monarchy. The Sussexes don't need to rush into anything. They're still extremely high profile people. In fact, maybe even more high profile now after stepping back from uh, the royal family and since making this bombshell announcement, they're probably more famous than they even were beforehand. What do the inner circle of Harry and Meghan's world think of this? Since Meghan and Harry have stepped away from their role as senior members of the royal family, what we are seeing is a completely new chapter and really, as one source told us, uncharted waters. What Megan's friends feel is that she's going to put her, her family first. She's going to put her son first. Her life as a mom is so important to her. And if everyone is chattering around her about, you know, but what about this? But she shouldn't have said that. She shouldn't be here. She shouldn't be there. That's something she's going to push out of her mind. I think an important thing to understand is that Meghan and Harry don't feel beholden to some of the rules that would govern William and Kate, who are in line to be future king and queen. We were told by a friend of Harry's that Harry the royal and Harry the person are two very different figures. And Harry the person wants to thrive. And I think that Meghan's friends and Harry's are completely supportive and thrilled for them because it was hard to watch them feel so suppressed. Meghan Markle and Prince Harry have left Canada, reports People Magazine. So People Magazine has been covering the royals really since the inception of the magazine for decades and decades. We have incredible relationships.
incredible access. We often know something is gonna happen before the public does, before the rest of the media does. Ultimately, Megan was pulled back to Los Angeles. That's where she launched her career. They are doing everything that they can to create a more peaceful life for Archie and for themselves and for their own sanity. They knew that they had to do something. We all knew that something had to give. Prince Harry and Meghan Markle got their wish, but they didn't. <laughs> they are still very much in the spotlight. I mean, there is a huge glare on them. Everyone wants to know what this new life looks like. And I don't think that's going away anytime soon. A lot of people are wondering, will things ever be the same in this royal family? I think we're seeing like a new age of royals and it'll be really interesting to see what happens with them and how they forge their own path, not just tied to the royal family. Never underestimate what your actions, your choices and your resilience means to us. They stood up for themselves, and in so doing, they really paved the way for future royals to be able to do that. I mean, their own son, Archie, and William and Kate's children may find that they have more autonomy and freedom decades from now because Meghan and Harry were willing to make the bold move. They have been through so much, and this is a love story. People Magazine readers and Americans are really hoping that Harry and Meghan have a happy ending.
So she does have Venus in Virgo, which is a difficult Venus position. Venus in Virgo is, I love you, comma, but your feet are stinky. I love you, comma, but I know you're a royal, but could you not be? <laughs> They're so bloody good together because Harry is a Virgo. And of course, Meghan has Venus in Virgo. So when somebody's Venus is on your son, it's like you meet and it's love at first sight. So it's all or nothing, do or die. A yes is a yes, a no is a no, a maybe is why the heck are we still talking. They are quite naturally a revolutionary coupling. After a handful of dates, things moved quickly, and Prince Harry invited Meghan to accompany him on a trip to Botswana in Africa. A light in a royal wedding. I mean, it's like, it's the fairy tale. The royal wedding is Cinderella's castle, Prince Charming, all of that rolled up into one. And like so many decisions in this couple's life, they chose a different kind of royal wedding from their predecessors. The average wedding in America these days costs around $35,000, which seems like a lot and a pretty compelling case for a drive-through off the main drag in Vegas. The most recent royal wedding